Hey, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Central's 3D class on uh, the history of the church from Pentecost to the present. Uh, as you can clearly see, um, I am not David Shari. Uh, he sends his regrets. Uh, he is, I believe, in Indianapolis attending a Bethany's fellow meeting for the week. So he asked me to uh, impersonate a host. So I am doing that with Bruce's permission. So uh, I will give a just brief uh, introduction to uh, Bruce Breeding, our uh, teacher. Uh, he's a colleague. Uh, he teaches at LTS as well as at BCTC. And he's also the minister at our uh, sister congregation Lafayette here in Lexington. So Bruce introduced to us uh, last week, the uh, first century of the church, and we look forward to moving through time. So Bruce, thank you again for being with us. We're grateful for your knowledge uh, and for your contributions to the life of witness of the larger church. So it is all yours, sir. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate that. And again, it's, uh, it's always uh, a pleasure uh, and a privilege to be with you all. Uh, for an hour on this beautiful Tuesday night. For those of us who are in Lexington, we just had a round of thunderstorms come through. We may have another round or two come through before, uh, before the evening's over. We may be interrupted. Uh, I don't expect that we'll um, be off the air, but if you all see a, a, an Indian head and a test pattern and hear, Boop, you'll know that uh, <laughs> you're back in the 50s. Uh, and um, I'll come back as soon as I can. So last week, uh, as Paul shared with you all, we um, or I left off uh, with essentially um, the early church. And so what I would like to do today uh, is to pick up uh, where we left off um, with the period uh, that historians call late antiquity. Now, they didn't used to call uh, it late antiquity. It was one of those periods of time that we didn't know what to call, uh, and so we used to just talk about it as the time when the Roman Empire uh, fell, when it collapsed. And so uh, I do want to make sure you all can see my PowerPoint. Is that correct? Okay. So you see here that I've I've laid out the dates for late antiquity, uh, roughly a 200 year period. Uh, and I just, I realized after, after we were together last week that I might need to unpack some terminology. And um, that's the terminology of dates. Uh, most of us uh, are used to seeing uh, BC and AD, BC being an abbreviation for the English before Christ, and A.D. being uh, an abbreviation for the Latin Anno Domini, which means the year of our Lord. My wife teaches religion uh, at uh, the Catholic high school here in Lexington, and she always has students that say that A.D. stands for after death, uh, which it does not. Uh, and in addition to the fact that it doesn't stand for that, uh, if you hold to the tradition that uh, Jesus uh, lived to be 33 years old, there's a 33-year gap with no years. If you've got the years before Christ and the years after death, you've got a 33-year gap where there's no way to, to mark those years. But in fact, it stands for B.C., A.D., before Christ, Anno Domini. Now, obviously, in the 21st century, uh, the Christian calendar, the calendar that says today is May the 3rd, 2022, is the dominant global calendar. It's the calendar for business. Uh, it's the calendar that computers recognize. But it is not uh, the calendar uh, that uh, is culturally tied to most of the world. Most of the world, in terms of the number of human beings living on Earth, use the Chinese calendar or the Hindu calendar 
or the Muslim calendar. They use calendars, uh, most of which are lunar. And so um, what scholars uh, have done in recognition of uh, the fact that this is essentially the dominant calendar of the world is they have used these terms CE and uh, BCE. And CE stands for the Common Era. So today is, is the 2000, we are uh, May the 3rd, uh, the 2022nd year of the Common Era. Because for us, we do say this is the 2022nd year of our Lord. But if you're a, a Buddhist uh, living in Hunan province, you don't claim Jesus as your Lord, but you are sort of culturally appropriated by this calendar. So that's what that terminology means. And depending on where you're reading, you'll see BCE, CE, rather than BC and AD. And I just wanted to explain those, that those are really um, ways of, ex of expanding the understanding and the use of uh, the Christian calendar, because I, I'm going to guess, I know I certainly don't know what today's date is in the Muslim calendar or in the Hindu calendar or, or, or in the Chinese calendar. Like most Americans uh, who grew up uh, on uh, paper placemats, I know I was born in the year of the tiger, but that's all I know about the Chinese calendar. So having said that, uh, let me um, move on then to our discussion of late antiquity. Now, when we talk about this period of time, we talk really uh, out of the information that we have from a book. Most, most of us kind of have this mental image. If we know anything about Rome, we know that uh, in the years uh, between essentially 200 and 400, that the Roman Empire fell. That's what we were taught. Uh, now, primarily, this view comes out of a book written by a British historian named Ed Edward Gibbon. And Edward Gibbon wrote a book that was published the same year that the Declaration of Independence was written, 1776. And this book was called The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire. And so what I've given you here on this uh, slide is an image on the left of Edward Gibbon. And uh, just so you don't get confused on the right, that is an actual Gibbon. And I don't think Edward Gibbon had any given blood in him, but you know, when a guy's, if your last name is chimpanzee, you, you have to put a picture of a chimpanzee up on the, up on the screen. So Edward Gibbon, a British historian who essentially um, first put forth this idea that the empire fell. He sees what happens in Rome between two and 400 as decline. That's the really the way he sees that um, that the the empire experience. That actually, uh, the, there's a typo in the book is called the De the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. He actually sees this as a concept of decline, whereas now we don't look at this period of time as much as a, a time of decline as we do. Uh, a time of transformation, a time of change. In many cases, uh, it was a time of enrichment. So it's not a period of time where Rome goes from being this glorious, wonderful culture that, we, that we're all familiar with in terms of images. It's not a time when Rome goes from being this glorious culture to uh, crumbled ruins but rather it's a time of, um, of change, of um, institutional transformation, uh, of political transformation. And certainly for our purposes, it is a time when the church, when Christianity grows significantly and undergoes what is still arguably the 
uh, biggest single um, uh, event in the history of the church during the first 1,000 years that Christianity exists. And this idea of how we understand history, just again to give you all uh, some language that a professional historian would use, this is called historiography. Uh, and my definition of historiography, I think it's a very simple and easy definition, is that historiography is the study of the study of history. In other words, if we look at um, an historical event, right? Uh, Henry Clay's years as the Speaker of the House and later as a member of the United States Senate and Henry Clay's impact on uh, holding the United States together before the Civil War. If I just told you about Henry Clay, that's history. Telling a story of the past is history. But how we understand that event and studying how we understand that event, that's historiography. So if, if we look at a history book written in the, 17, in the 1890s, it's going to talk about Henry Clay in a particular way. If we read a history text written in the 1930s, it's going to talk about Henry Clay in a particular way. If we read a textbook written five years ago, it's going to talk about Henry Clay in a different way. And the way we understand the past and the way we understand our own evolving and nuanced changing understanding of the past, that's history. And so really we have moved away from uh, the historiography of seeing this 200 year period as the collapse of, of Rome. We've moved into seeing this 200 year period as uh, a time of change, a time of maturation, a time of uh, some continuity. Uh, but really uh, not a time of just decline. Now, at the beginning of this period of time, um, it's important before we talk specifically about the church, it's important to understand uh, what happened politically. And what happened politically uh, was uh, a, a, a reform of the government uh, put in place uh, by the Emperor Diocletian. And you can see here uh, the years that Diocletian ruled. He came to the throne uh, sometime around the year 284, uh, and he was the emperor of, of Rome until 305. And during um, Diocletian's rule, uh, the, emperor, the empire really began a period of sh shifting political and economic power and influence from the West to the East. And uh, as a response to those shifts, Diocletian uh, reformed the way the empire was governed. Uh, he created what he called the Tetrarchy which uh, for those of us who ever owned a uh, tropical fish, uh, no, tetra is the word for four. And so this was uh, rule by four. So each half of the empire, and you can see here that the empire on this map is divided right at this line. So you've got the green and gold half here on the left, that's the west, and you have the fuchsia and the uh, purple half on the right, that's the east. And so the, the West and the East essentially divided. And each half of the empire had, uh, for, for lack of a, of a better phrase in English, had, an, had a, an emperor and a vice emperor. And what uh, Diocletian did is he used the language of the past. And so the name that uh, Diocletian gave to, to the emperors was Augustus. The plural is Augusti. So there were two Augusti. Diocletian was the Augusti in the West, and Maximian was the Augusti, or was the Augustus in the East. And then each of these uh, Augusti had an assistant, 
a Caesar, the plural is Caesare. So Galerius was the Caesar in the West, the assistant emperor. Const Constantius was the Caesar in the East. So you have essentially an emperor and a vice emperor. And the way Diocletian set this system up was that when the emperor died or retired, he would be succeeded by his assistant. So the Caesar would become the Augustus. And he hoped that this system would create stability because you would know who is going to be the next person up in the chain of leadership. But as is the case, uh, when you put uh, multiple people in power, and I found this image, this is a, a statue, a carved statue of the Tetrarchy. When you put positions, uh, people in positions of power, uh, almost always you're setting yourself up for conflict. And this is what happened here. Uh, instead of uh, functioning as a smooth way to um, change leadership, it really became a way to uh, plot uh, who was going to be in a position of power next. And uh, when Diocletian retired, uh, instead of things running smoothly, what essentially happened was conflict and war. And for about eight years, you had, a, you had a period when there were various claims to these four aspects of the throne. And by the year 312, um, this conflict came to a head. One of the men who came out of this conflict was the son of Constantinus a man named Constantine. And beginning in the year 306, uh, with the death, or with the retirement, rather, of Diocletian, Constantine himself laid claim to the title of Augustus. Uh, he didn't not only declared himself to be the Augustus of the East, he declared himself to be the Augustus of the West. And one of the things that he did was uh, to order the building of a, uh, a large city. This city uh, sits right here uh, at where the Black Sea empties into the Mediterranean. We certainly all know about this now because it is a major flashpoint in what is going on right up here in Ukraine and in the Crimean Peninsula. There was an old city that had been uh, on this location for centuries. That city was called Byzantium. And what Constantine did is he decided this, in the midst of this conflict, he was going to essentially build a new Roman capital and um, in uh, a tremendous display of self-assurance and arrogance, uh, he named it after himself. Constantine's city, Constantine's polis. Polis or polis is the Greek word for city. And so just as we are two hours south of the city of the Indians, Indianapolis, this is the city of Constantine, Constantinople. And so Constantine uh, immediately uh, asserts his political authority uh, and his power by uh, saying, I'm setting up a new location in the eastern part of the empire. I'm naming it after myself. I'm placing it in a very strategic location. And this is going to be my way of sort of uh, planting my flag and saying, this is the new face of the Roman empire. Now, uh, at this point, uh, we move really away from uh, what we can um, talk about in terms of uh, factuality, if that's a word, in terms of facts, 
into um, story. And story uh, is, uh, I don't mean to denigrate story, story is certainly a very powerful tool. Uh, the story, the tradition uh, centers around a real event, a battle held just north of Rome at a place called the Milvian Bridge. Excuse me. And on uh, the night of October 27th in the year 312, that's by our calendar, they would not have called it that. But by the year October, uh, uh, on, the, um, on the night of October 27th in the year 312, the eve of this battle, when Constantine knows that his soldiers are heading into, into battle, he has a dream. And in his dream, uh, he hears the voice of God. And God uh, says to him in Latin, in oc sino vinces, which uh, essentially translates to, by this sign, you shall conquer. And in his dream, when he hears this voice in the sky, he looks up and he sees the clouds have formed this symbol here that you see my cursor spinning around. We know this, every one of us who has gone through uh, middle school or junior high in a Christian church disciples congregation, we know this as the Cairo, the Chi here, the Roman letter for X, and the Rho, which looks like a, a P, this is the Roman R. So these would be the two, the first two letters of the Greek word Christus. And so this is a, a Greek chi and a Greek uh, R. And this was, even by Constantine's time, this was a symbol for Christianity. And so Constantine ordered his soldiers to scoop their hands down into the mud and on the front of their shields to scrawl these two symbols, the chi and the rho. And he went into battle, his soldiers went into battle on the, on the morning of October the 28th, and they were victorious. They essentially defeated the forces of the last remaining um, uh, uh, rival for the throne. Uh, and with this victory now, Constantine essentially solidified uh, his place as the new emperor of all of Rome. And so in retrospect, Constantine saw this as a seminal moment in his life. The voice of God speaking to him, telling him to place this Christian symbol on his, uh, the shields of his soldiers, and essentially fighting in the name of Christ uh, for victory. Now, we tend to think of Constantine as the first Christian emperor, but the reality is that he was not. Uh, Constantine was baptized as a Christian on his deathbed. Uh, he, he was one of those folks uh, who was able to have his cake and eat it too. He didn't have to ask forgiveness of his sins, and he didn't have to stop sinning until the very end. And then he just slipped in under the wire, and uh, in the last few days of his life, he said, oh, I'm sorry for all this. Please forgive me. He's baptized, and he becomes a Christian. But the real influence, the real uh, voice in the ear of the emperor uh, the real Christian in this story is Constantine's mother, Helena. She was a convert to Christianity, and all of the evidence that we have really says that she was a true and faithful adherent to Christianity. And in fact, it is uh, Helena, who is responsible uh, for uh, two of the holiest sites of Christianity. It is Helena 
uh, who who was responsible essentially for um, the two the two churches that exist today, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher in Jerusalem and the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. Now, of course, we're talking about someone who lived three centuries after Jesus, but uh, it was Helena that that uh, that uh, did her best to locate the actual. You're frozen, Bruce. Bruce, can you hear us? Bruce? Ken, can you hear me? I can, yes, but I think Bruce is frozen. Yes, I think he just left us. Hopefully he uh, will re-enter and, and we'll move past the moment. So you're gonna take over now? Yes. You, did I, did something <laughs> happen to me? Yes, you you impersonated Helena and became stone like. Oh no! Yes, All welcome right. back. Well, what's funny is I had a blip, but but it still showed me on. Can you you can hear and see me now? Yes, sir. You are good to go. Thank all you right. very what much. What's the last thing that fell out of my face that you all heard? Holy Sepulchre and Church okay. of the Nativity. All right, good. So that's what that's what Helena is essentially responsible for doing. Okay, can you see my PowerPoint? All right. So, um, what does Constantine do? Well, uh, as you all can see from this slide here, I expect you all to read this document and to understand this document, and there will be a content-based exam uh, at the end of tonight's presentation over this document. So, what does Constantine do? Well, Constantine Although he is not the, you know, although he is, um, he does not become a Christian until the end of his life, what Constantine does is nonetheless significant. And the first thing that Constantine does is issue a, an edict, an official statement, and I've given you the text of it here, and you can Google it as well. Uh, and it is, it is promulgated uh, in uh, what is today the, the Italian city of Milan. Um, at the time, it was called Miodulanum, but uh, we know it as the Edict of Milan. And what the Edict of Milan does, what this paragraph of six-point font that you all can see here, what it does is it creates as the policy of the empire religious tolerance. It simply states that the Roman governmental officials are not going to punish anybody for their religious beliefs or lack of religious beliefs, and they are not going to prevent anyone from practicing any religion. So it's a very kind of generic statement about uh, an end to religious persecution and a, and a tolerance of religious diversity and religious practice and a tolerance of not having religious practice. So one of the things that we talked about last week, the uh, imperial cult, this, this issue that comes up a lot in the New Testament, that, uh, that, the, that the emperor was divine, that concept uh, certainly goes away here with this idea that there is now uh, no set uh, ma mandated religious belief. Now, later on, uh, Constantine uh, does um, three other things. He, he makes, he puts in place three other policies that are really important for the church. Uh, the first of these is uh, he removes from church leadership any requirement for military service. Uh, throughout Rome, uh, uh, there was a patchwork of expectations about military service. Uh, you know, some of us are aware that in, in some countries, I think Israel is probably the most well-known country, there is mandatory military service. 
Um, you know, when you watch a movie and you watch Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman, uh, just, you know, thrash somebody, she can do that in real life. She was an Israeli soldier. She, she knows how to kill you uh, within about 15 seconds, if, if need be. Uh, within Rome, there was, uh, in many parts of the empire, mandatory religious or mandatory military service. And Constantine uh, puts forth an edict that removes church leadership from that requirement. So if you are a leader in the church, and we'll talk about church leadership on the next slide, you do not have to serve in the military. Uh, Constantine also um, issues an edict, a statement, a policy that the Roman government will return property that it had confiscated from the church and from uh, Christians uh, in earlier times of persecution. And certainly, uh, I think the most important uh, thing that Constantine does is he removes uh, the requirement that uh, the church or that churches, and that's probably a more accurate term, because we're really still talking here about a period when there are house churches. Um, he removes uh, the requirement that churches pay taxes. And if you are in a position of leadership at Central Christian Church, you know that that is just incredibly important, right? I mean, Central sits on a really valuable piece of land in Lexington but it pays no property tax. Whatever money comes in in the coffers, whatever money is donated into the offerings every Sunday, the church, my church, your church, the folks at the most conservative and vocal church in town, Clays Mill Baptist, the folks at the most liberal religious organization in town, the UUs down on Clays Mill Road or the Baha'i faith, they don't pay any taxes on the money that they make. Now, Lafayette, up until a few years ago, we had a house that we owned, a rent house. We paid tax on that. But churches don't pay tax on their income. And that the history of that, even in the United States in the year 2022, goes back to this Roman practice of the church not having to pay taxes. And and what, um, what comes out of this as well is under Constantine, the church now becomes essentially a legal entity, right? So that, you know, today all of us are familiar with the fact that we can, we can bequeath things to the church, right? Uh, I want to give my collection of Hot Wheels cars to the church when I die so that the youth can play with them or so that the church can sell them at the bluegrass auction and reap the financial rewards of that. Um, you know, there are certain things that have legal standing. I can't leave all of my uh, worldly goods to my dog, but I can leave all of my worldly goods to the church. And so the idea that the church is a thing that can own and hand, that can own property, that can receive money, this all starts during the rule of Constantine. So, I mean, this is just an incredibly important moment because up until Constantine does this, the church is the church that we read about in the New Testament. It is a, it is a voluntary group of individuals who worship in small communities and who essentially uh, live, uh, and, and I use this term uh, with a little bit of trepidation, uh, the church is underground. It's not literally underground, but it, it exists um, apart from the normal institutions of society. After Constantine, that's not true. After Constantine now, the church begins to function as a le legitimate entity that's part of the rest of society. And there are, there are lots of theologians and church historians who argue that this was the worst thing that could ever happen to the church. Because prior to Constantine, to be a Christian, to be committed to being a Christian was a real commitment. After Constantine, 
becoming a Christian uh, simply loses its um, its power, loses its cachet. It, it's no longer something that requires absolute commitment. It's like the conversation between the pig and the and the chicken uh, talking about Farmer Brown's uh, breakfast, and the the pig says to the chicken, "Yeah, when you, you know, when." When Farmer Brown uh, has breakfast, you offer up a contribution. When Farmer Brown has breakfast, I offer up a commitment, the pig says. So, you know, there's a difference between a contribution and a commitment. And so now with Constantine uh, and the fact that the church is no longer a countercultural entity, it becomes part of the mainstream, uh, it certainly reshapes and changes what the church is. And uh, what happens during this period of time, and it starts in the New Testament, is that within the church itself, we now see the emergence of, of, of jobs or offices within the church. And there are three uh, role responsibilities or jobs or offices or positions, whatever, whatever word you want to use, there are th three of these um, titles that we see in the New Testament. All three of these Greek words that you see are on this slide are in the New Testament. And the New Testament is, is very clear about one of them, and that is the word diakonos. Um, that's the word we translate into the English deacon. You can read the New Testament, and, and it is, it's very clear that, that these Christian communities, these, these church communities, it's very clear that they exist, uh, that within all of them, there exists the role of deacon. And the deacon uh, is uh, sometimes a man and it's sometimes a woman. And the deacon is the person who does all of the grunt work, the stuff that has to be done. Uh, if you have a Christian community, somebody literally has to set up the chairs and wash the dishes and prepare the food. And that's what the deacons do, right? Early Christian worship uh, developed a pretty um, consistent pattern all across the Mediterranean. Christians would get together, they would worship and sing and, and maybe read from scripture. And then uh, at the end of worship, they would have a potluck meal that they called the love feast. And then somewhere within that love feast, they would have a communion service. And all of that takes work. Every one of us who's ever gone to a church a function knows that it is a lot of work that involved. And that's what the deacons do. And that seems pretty clear. Um, Another word that we see um, in, uh, in the New Testament uh, in relationship to these congregations is the word Presbyterian. And I've had this conversation uh, with Ken uh, in his class um, because of Ken's, back Ken's background as an optometrist. Um, uh, the word presb Presbyterian or presbyter literally means in English elder. Uh, the, the medical term for farsightedness is presbyopia. Geezer eyes is really what it means. Uh, I, <laughs> I discovered that literally on my 40th birthday, having worn glasses since I was in the fifth grade. On my 40th birthday, the doctor said, now you're, you need to have reading glasses as well. And I looked over and on his form, he'd written presbyopia. So this term presbyter means elderly, but it also means elder in the sense that we think of an elder as, as someone who's wise. So it doesn't just mean someone who's superannuated, who's old. It can also mean somebody who's wise. And this word, we begin to translate into the English word priest. So we do know that there were many New Testament congregations that had elders. And it seems that this position of elder was the teacher within a Christian community. So when Paul wrote his letter to the Christian community at Corinth, for example, he was not writing to one church. He was writing to a group of house churches in the city of Corinth. And each of these house churches would probably have had a presbyter. 
somebody who teaches, somebody who leads the worship service. And finally, uh, the word, and this is the one that, that uh, gets everybody's hackles up, uh, the word that we see in the New Testament is this Greek word, uh, episkopoi. And uh, it is the word that we translate as uh, overseer or bishop. And what begins to happen, and this is, this is really, it's really kind of hard, particularly for us as free church Protestants, it's really kind of hard for us to wrap our heads around this. Because you can see at the beginning, of, you can see at the New Testament that this is beginning to start to happen, simply because the, the fact that this word is in the Bible. Uh, but what's beginning to happen certainly comes into full flower by the time of early antiquity, and that is the fact that these Christian communities feel a real necessity of being linked together. So if we lived in Corinth and we had uh, nine Christian communities in Corinth, nine house churches that met in Corinth, and each of us, each of these house churches had a presbyter, and each of these house churches had six or eight or ten deacons. What links us together? How do we know that what the presbyter in my house church is saying is the same as what the presbyter in Jim Catlett's house church is saying? Or the presbyter in uh, um, Ken, uh, Ken's house church is saying? Or the presbyter in Susie's house church? How do we know? Well, and, uh, and so what comes into existence sort of organically is this person who travels around, who links these churches together, uh, who essentially becomes the presbyter for the presbyters, the priest of the priests. And that's this person that we call the bishop. So, for example, we know that by the time Constantine issues the Edict of Milan, that in the peninsula of Italy alone, there were 80 bishops. We know that the Christian community was large enough in the year 313 that there were 80 of these overseers in Italy. So that gives you a sense of how fast the church is growing. And, and this is because, and this is, this is probably the most uh, controversial thing that I'm going to say in the five weeks that we're together, but I'm, I feel absolutely comfortable in saying this because I'm backed up by a lot of evidence. And that is, if you read the New Testament, I mean, if you really read the New Testament closely, every author of every word in the New Testament believed that they would see Jesus return in their lifetime. And so if you firmly, honestly believe that the world is going to end in your lifetime, you just don't invest a whole lot of time in planning for the future. And so if you're part of the leadership of the church, you don't envision a church that's going to go on for 300 years. And so this idea of what is the structure going to look like, that idea never pops in your head. Because you have in front of you copies of the gospel in which Jesus says, this generation will not pass away before I come back, right? And so all of these controversial issues that start to come up, how does the church govern itself? What does it mean to be linked to one another? What happens now when we start having uh, Christian communities where uh, all of the witnesses to the earthly Jesus die off? And now the memory of Jesus is simply something that we carry in our heads, right? I mean, all of us, not all of us, but uh, some of us in this discussion tonight will be alive at some point in the next, I'm going to be generous here. All of us, some of us in this virtual room will be alive in the next 10 years when the last veteran of World War II dies. And the memory of World War II vanishes from the human experience. 
and it simply becomes pure history. Nobody will remember it anymore. They'll read about it and they'll know about it, but nobody will remember it. And that's what's happening in this first two decades of the church. Everybody who knew Jesus is dying. And nobody ever thought, well, what, you know, when do we baptize folks? You baptize folks when they became Christians. But now you have two Christians who get married, and what about their children? You baptize their children? Do you wait till their children are able to, to understand? Do you have a mandatory pastor's class when they're 12 and their grandparents are poking them in the small of the back, saying, go down front, go down front, go down front. You need to take pastor's class and go down front and get baptized. And then they're 39 before they realize what they've done and they really understand it, Right. So the church is wrestling with all of that. And all of this, this business of how the church itself governs and, and, and administers itself, this is not something that somebody sat down with a pen and paper and said, let's create a flow chart here and, and organize this thing so that it makes sense. It's all happening on the fly. So once the church now under Constantine becomes part of mainstream society, and once the church now comes out from the underground and the church is, uh, is no longer persecuted, and the church is, is something that people know about, even if you're not a participant, now the church has to wrestle with what does it mean to be a Christian? What are the teachings that we hold to? And as the church uh, struggles with this, what comes into existence are what come to be known as heresies, right? Now, we know this. Every single, and again, I'm not, I'm not telling tales uh, out behind the school. Every disciple of Christ congregation in Lexington, Kentucky, has wrestled with the issues of human sexuality. And how do we as a congregation remain faithful to our beliefs and deal with these issues that are so politically polarizing, so emotionally polarizing. And that's what the church is going through at, in the early years. What, is, what do we believe? What does it mean to be a faithful Christian? And what beliefs are we going to say are integral and foundational? And what beliefs are we going to say are not? Now, as disciples, right, uh, we just, I mean, as soon as somebody says the word creed, we just come unglued, right? But that's the church's coping mechanism with how you deal with these heresies. What does it mean to be a Christian? Well, the first major heresy that the church has to deal with comes in the decade after Constantine issues the Edict of Milan, when a bishop down in Alexandria, Egypt, at the mouth of the Nile, a bishop named Arius, in his sermons, talks about the nature of Christ in relation to God. Who is Christ? Who is Jesus? Are Jesus and Christ the same entity? Are Jesus and Christ and God the same entity? Now, for Arius, who, who very, very reads the Old Testament and reads his, uh, reads his Hebrew scripture very narrowly, right? Uh, he was an originalist, to put him in, in the language of, of the bomb that went off last night. Um, Arius would say the Shema, the, the, the great statement of Judaism is, the Lord is God, the Lord is one. And so for Arius, to believe in God is to believe in the one God. And so Arius says, as a Christian, I cannot believe that Jesus is God because only God is God. For Arius, Jesus, the phrase he uses is the firstborn of God's creation. Now, the majority of the Christian faith at this time is not comfortable with Arius's language. So how do you respond to this? If you're a new movement that's only 300 years old, how do you respond to this? And so what the church does is it organizes a council, and all of the bishops in the Christian world who can travel to the city of Nicaea, which is in modern-day Turkey. And in the year 
325, there is a council, the Council of Nicaea. And these bishops all gather together and they say, all right, this is our this is our first opportunity since the since the New Testament canon had, had come together and had coalesced. This is our first opportunity to say to each other and to the rest of the world, what is it that makes us a Christian? Now, for us as disciples, we're very comfortable. What makes you a Christian? You, you make the good confession. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. You're in, right? Uh, that's not the approach <laughs> uh, in Nicaea. In Nicaea, the approach is, let's, let's nail down as many of these loose boards as we can. Who's in and who's out? And so they come up with this creed. Now, this is not the entire Nicene Creed, but this is the part of the Nicene Creed I'm showing you here that is a direct response to what is perceived as the heresy of Arianism. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, one in being with the Father. That you cannot be any clearer than that. Is Jesus the firstborn of all creation? No. And as we say here in the South, not just no, but literally, hell no. You go to hell if you believe something other than this. This is the concrete foundational statement of the church about the nature of Jesus. Was Jesus uh, uh, just a human who had really good ideas? Was was Jesus a, a human body who was the vessel for the divine Christ? No. All together, Jesus is flesh and blood Jesus. Jesus is divine Christ. Jesus is God and human. Jesus is divine and mortal. Jesus is true God from true God, begotten, not made, one in being with the Father. Very much like the preamble to the Gospel of John. So, first 200 years of the history of the church, lots of change, lots of growth, very dynamic, and all of it being done by incredibly faithful and committed people who don't know what they're doing and who have to trust very much that they are listening to the voice of God because they don't have a blueprint. They don't have a bylaw and a constitution that tells them what they're supposed to do. They are feeling their way through in the dark. And so uh, I am happy. I'm going to pull up the chat here. Who called the council? Constantine or some of the bishops? I do not think Constantine called it, Ken. That's a good question. I think it was called. Uh, it may have been by this point called by the Bishop of Rome, and that's the thing we're going to talk about next week, which is this whole business of how the Bishop of Rome becomes the Pope. But uh, I don't know the answer to that question. That's a good question, though. Did I put anybody, uh, uh, I hope I didn't put anybody in a REM sleep. So. Paul, do you know of any other questions? No, I don't see any other, Bruce. Um, from my end, the chat room is now empty. I, I will make a comment um, in, in my memory bank. Um, I believe Constantine was the primary mover for the first council. And that is because of two things. One, uh, he understood Christianity to be the glue that would hold this new entity called the Roman Empire together, right. as you so aptly described, moving from the, uh, the tetratar to, to a, 
to the solo emperor. Right. And therefore he needed to have, if you will, a consensus statement as a military man and not a theologian. I don't believe he was interested as much in the substance, but he knew the style had to be there. Right. Um, and so that's one thing. And then it's also part of my memory, I believe that, that he actually uh, <laughs> provided the funds, okay. both in terms of travel uh, and accommodations. Sure. And so, uh, shall we say, he, he greased the institutional wheels right. uh, so that the uh, gathering of the bishops would um, not necessarily meet his theological aim, but meet his, uh, what shall we say, uh, imperial necessity yes. of having this consensus movement uh, anchoring, if you will, his new concept. I right. believe and, I'm correct, Bruce, in also saying that when he, after he conquered at the uh, Milvian Bridge, he came and asked to see the Bishop of Rome, and the Bishop of Rome came to him, um, shall we say, expecting doom and not glory. <laughs> He yeah. thought he would. He thought he was going to be executed. Yeah, yeah. So this this transition was uh, dramatic. Uh, it was obviously and, and, and you know, unexpected. As, as you, yeah, as you pointed out, I mean, uh, I, I think from a twenty first century perspective, we would say that that uh, Constantine was a very uh, skilled politician to know that this that this social religious movement that he can he can use it to achieve his goals. And not get bogged down in the minutia of right. of what it you know what it means. And of course, this you know once you've opened that Pandora's box, now uh, not every successive uh, uh, political leader is going to be able to deal with that. And so, what does happen over the next two thousand years, obviously, is you begin to have, in many cases, an unholy alliance between between uh, splinter groups within Christianity and within politicians. I mean, look at the number of, of, of Christians who die in Europe in the next two millennia fighting other Christians. And so, you know, a politician who does get bogged down in the theological debate over real presence versus, uh, you know, uh, transubstantiation versus consubstantiation, uh, you know, you end up with these the sometimes really arcane theological arguments that that result in in lots of blood being shed, but but Constantine I think uh, wanted to be able to use, as you said, I love that word glue, uh, you know, to use uh, what what cohesiveness Christianity could produce without really having to have the imperial court worry about the nature of Jesus's divinity. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. I uh, uh, I don't get I get to talk about this uh, every now and then, but uh, you know, just to be able to find a picture of two bishops here uh, um, swinging haymakers at one another for this slide, uh, you know, it's not something you get to do very often. I'll pull that back up again so you get a chance to see it, just because it's took me so long to find it. I thought, hey, you got to, you know, guys in church garb hitting each other, pretty cool. So there they are. So. Um, I uh, will be happy to, to take any more questions that you all have. And if not, uh, when we uh, join together next week, uh, we will uh, talk really about uh, another uh, event that is so hard for a, a lot of Protestants to, uh, to, to understand, and that is the, the, the consolidation of power in Rome itself and, and the and the creation of the papacy. We good to go? I don't see anything in the chat box, Bruce. All right. So thank you all for being here, every thank one you, of you. Uh, uh, thank you, Bruce. Thank you. And uh, I will see you all uh, next. Tuesday. Tuesday. All right. Have Thank a good you, week, Bruce. Everyone. Thanks, Bruce. All right. Thanks, Bruce. Bye -bye. You're welcome. Thanks again. Very good. Thank you.